started. Good morning and welcome to the final round of the 53rd annual Roger J. Trainer Moot Court competition. A couple of quick thank yous. Uh, first, a huge part of the success of this event uh, is because of our host school, the University of West Los Angeles School of Law. So I'd like to thank Robert Brown, the president, and Jay Frickberg, the provost and dean, Jesse Aldava, who's the Director of Institutional Research and E-Learning, and Mauricio Cana, Library Services Manager. Thank you also to all of our able and dedicated student bailiffs. And thank you to all our judges who devoted their Saturday yesterday to this event. We are very, very grateful. The trainer was made possible by a generous grant from the Giznet Mandel Moot Court Trust, with special thanks to Patrick and Ingela Pigot. And lunch for the judges was made possible by our gold sponsor, Esner Chang and Boyer, with special thanks to Stuart Esner. And uh, finally, the competition program, which has a synopsis of the case and information about this competition and um, Everything that you need to know about the trainer can be found on our website, trainermootcourt.org. And I'm Miriam Billington, the Trainer Moot Court Administrator. So thank you all for coming. And now what we've all been waiting for, the final round between team four and team six. Acting as our bailiff today is Professor David Glassman, a decades long supporter of this competition. And for the purposes of this session, Professor Glassman and I are not affiliated with either of these teams. Um, we thank you. And I would like to now turn over the proceeding to uh, our bailiff who will introdu introduce the justices for this morning and our team members. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. The final round of the 2022 Roger Trainer Moot Court competition will be presided over by three justices of the California Court of Appeal. Our presiding justice this morning is presiding justice Dennis Perlis. Uh, joining him are associate justices Helen Bendix and Frank Menetrez, all of the Court of Appeal. At this time, I would like each competitor to activate uh, the camera and so that we can confirm who is arguing and in which order. Um, uh, let me begin with team four, counsel for the appellant. Uh, can you please introduce yourselves, indicate in which order you are going to present and uh, who is presenting rebuttal and for how long? Good morning, Flora Fazy. We will be arguing for the appellant, Mr. Prescott. I will discuss the detainment issue and my partner, Steve Martinez, will address the attenuation issue and he will reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Ms. Fazy. Uh, the respondent is represented by team six. Would each uh, Team 6 competitor please introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Julia Bennett, representing the respondents. I'll be arguing Issue 1, and my co-counsel, Fatima Lutta, will be arguing Issue 2. Thank you. I will provide each competitor with a display of time remaining, as you hopefully saw yesterday. In addition, I will also uh, 
quietly announce the time just to confirm that everyone is aware uh, of the remaining entrance, assuming you use enough time to get to the warnings. Um, so with that said, are there any questions before we proceed? Mr. Glassman, I cannot see Ms. Bennett's teammate on the, I, I see a, a blank space for Ms. Billington. Maybe we could see her teammate, if that's possible. Well, my video should be on, so I'm not sure. I don't, I don't see him, but I guess when, when it's their turn to argue, you'll make sure I see him, and, right? Okay. And that is Ms. Locke, co-counsel for respondent, correct? Perhaps, oh, well, I, I can see all four advocates right now, so. I can't, so. Uh, no, I'm right. sorry, is it my camera that you're having issues with? No, Ms. Mr. Martinez, I see you, but I don't okay. see Ms. Bennett's teammate. I think uh, that would be me, Ms. Locke. I'm sorry? I'm just identifying myself, Your Honor, for you. My name is oh, Fatima Ladda. Oh, okay. Um, Go ahead. All thank right. you. Oh, thank you very much. Now I see. Okay, thank you. So since it appears that both sides are ready to proceed, I will turn it over to Presiding Justice Perlis. Good morning uh, to all counsel. Uh, Ms. Fazy, whenever you're ready, you may begin. May it please the court. My name is Flora Fazy on behalf of the appellant, Mr. Prescott. I will address the detainment issue and my co-counsel, Mr. Steve Martinez will address the attenuation issue. Your honors, this case is not about watering down or diluting the protections of the fourth amendment. It's about preserving the rights of individuals by not tolerating police abuse or allowing fishing expeditions to occur under the guise of crime prevention. Therefore, we ask that you re reverse the Superior Court's decision denying Mr. Prescott's motion for the following two reasons. First, Officer Carroll did not have reasonable suspicion that Mr. Prescott committed a crime to lawfully detain him. And second, Mr. Prescott was seized within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment when officer pulled up behind Mr. Prescott and shined his light. First, an officer may briefly detain a person without a warrant if the officer has reasonable suspicion or more than a hunch that that person is involved in a crime. Prior to the ruling in Terry v. Ohio, the Supreme Court consistently held that the Fourth Amendment demanded a substantial showing of probable cause before police could interfere with the liberty or privacy interests of citizens. The Fourth Amendment safeguards the right of people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. With this case, the Supreme Court held for the first time that not all searches and seizures are unreasonable, unreasonable and therefore invalid. In doing so, the Terry Court adopted a reduced standard known as reasonable suspicion, permitting warrantless seizures of individuals so long as the stop is supported by an officer's reasonable suspicion. The court provided that an investigatory detention is justified if at its inception, an officer can point to specific and articulable facts that that person has or is committing a crime. However, in Justice Douglas's dissent in Terry v. Ohio, he cautioned that we are entering a new regime. A lesser standard would allow police officers to hassle citizens without limit and target those in society who are less favored, fortunate, and less protected. And as such, Ms. Ms. Fazy, is, is the standard as it has evolved that the suspect has or is involved, or is it that the suspect may be involved? And if it is maybe, does that make a difference in your argument? Your Honor, this, uh, the standard is that the um, individual may be involved in a crime. However, there's a totality of circumstances analysis, but the officer has to point to specific and articulable facts that justify that detention. And here, Officer Carroll did not have any facts that support him approaching Mr. Prescott because he was simply reclined in his vehicle. He was in the presence of an area of expected or suspected criminal activity, and he was in a parking lot of a closed business. Aren't those articulable facts? 
No, Your Honor. Those facts alone don't establish reasonable suspicion because they amount to a hunch for the officer. In the case of People v. Pitts, the fourth district in establishing reasonable suspicion for detention held again that that individual has to be connected to that crime, that the officer has to point to specific and articulable facts. In Pitts, the officers came to a neighborhood to investigate a possible narcotics position based on previous narcotics bust based on the residence or uh, on the same road. And the officer noticed that a male was sitting in a truck that was parked around the corner from that suspected residence. Based on his belief, the officer suspected that that man was connected to, a nar to narcotics trafficking. So the officer stopped him to question him. In that case, the defendant argued that the trial court was incorrect in determining that there was reasonable suspicion for him to be detained. Again, the court held that even assuming that that officer had a valid basis for believing that believing that, that residence was a drug sale site and a high crime area, his reliance on that fact alone without more is not is misplaced and was insufficient to establish reasonable suspicion. The court held that that is that suspicion amounted to a hunch and the officer had to point to specific facts that would connect that this individual was tied to that, that house or that narcotic sale. And here in our case, Officer Carroll had a hunch. A hunch is not a substitute for necessary specific articulable facts that require that is required by the Fourth Amendment. In our case, Officer Carroll is on a oh, um, and I raised my hand only because we're on Zoom. Um, um, what do you, you said he has a he had a hunch, but wasn't that hunch based merely in what the security officer told him? He never saw anything, correct? Yes, Your Honor, correct. So what's the hunch based on? So in this case, the 911 call that was reported by the security guard in the adjacent law, as cited on 310 of the record, was based on two individuals um, on bikes looking into vehicles. It had no tie to Mr. Prescott just simply sitting reclined in a, in a vehicle. A hunch is a feeling or a guess. It's an intuition rather than based on known facts. And that call on its own cannot establish reasonable suspicion without any corroborative element to it. Um, if Officer Carroll had seen Mr. Prescott, had seen a bike in Mr. Prescott's vehicle, then that would amount to enough suspicion to go ahead and question him. However, we don't have that in this case. So you're saying there's not even a hunch? There may have been a hunch, but a hunch alone may, is not sufficient to establish reasonable suspicion. Okay. Thank you. What, 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 if anything, was Officer Carroll to do with his hunch? Assuming your argument that he couldn't do what he did, was there anything that he could do? Or was he supposed to, under the law, just ignore uh, the car and Mr. Prescott? Well, Your Honor, Officer Carroll could have waited until there was more suspicious conduct from Mr. Prescott. He could have driven around the adjacent parking lot to investigate further. Instead, he merely went to the adjacent lot, saw the only car occupied, and just pulled his car behind him, shined his light, and detained that individual. That wasn't based on reasonable suspicion, and therefore... Could he could he have parked his car a distance away, not shined the spotlight, not asked Mr. Prescott to get out of the car and walked up to the car and said, I would like to talk to you? What is known yeah. as the law as a consensual encounter? Yes, Your Honor. He could have conducted a consensual encounter, could have approached Mr. Prescott, walked up to him and simply said, hey, did you notice any suspicious activity in this lot? But Officer Carroll did not do that. As cited on page 312 of the record, Officer Carroll instead went to the adjacent lot, parked behind him, shined his light, and called for backup for a second officer to come to the scene. A reasonable person in that situation would not feel free to leave, and therefore that's a detainment. And additionally, that takes me to my second point. Mr. Think, sorry, before you, before you leave the first point, I just wanted to follow up on the specific and articulable facts. I just want to be sure I understood your position. Um, is It seems to me that on the one hand, there's a question of whether the officer had reason to believe that there had been a crime committed anywhere at all, uh, you know, on this occasion in this area. And, and then the second question is, if so, 
was Mr. Prescott connected to it? You know, did they, what, was there a reasonable suspicion of a connection to it? In your description of the totality of the circumstances and your argument about it's being a hunch, it wasn't clear to me whether you were relying on one or the other or both. But as you know, was there a reasonable suspicion that a crime had been committed at, in the first place? Or is it that there wasn't reasonable suspicion of a connection between Mr. Prescott to that crime? Yes, Your Honor. There was no uh, reasonable suspicion that Mr. Prescott was connected to that crime. The reasonable suspicion standard requires that the officer suspects that this individual has committed a crime, is connected to that crime, or is going to commit a crime. And here, Officer Carroll, um, facts, uh, the facts that Officer Carroll points to do not establish that he had reasonable suspicion that Mr. Prescott had committed this uh, uh, crime. And all the 911 call provided was that there was two individuals on bicycles looking into cars. Mr. Prescott was just simply sitting reclined in his vehicle. Without more, Officer Carroll did not have sufficient suspicion to approach or detain Mr. Prescott at that point. In the case of People v. Presequa, the fourth district held that the officer lacked specific and articulable facts to justify his detention in a pat down search of the defendant. Again, here, the officer had brief, was briefed by detectives about a series of armed robberies at 7-Eleven stores. The officer was on patrol near the 7-Eleven store when he noticed uh, at about midnight, um, defendant's car was parked facing the exit um, side of the store. The five minutes remaining. The defendant's car caught the officer's attention because it was near the store's entrance and he was merely sitting in his car. The court held in that case that the officer did not have sufficient basis to go ahead and detain him and question him just because he was part of near criminal activity and that he had to point to other facts and other circumstances that would indicate that this individual is connected to that crime or was going to commit a crime. Moving on to my second point. Mr. Prescott was seized within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment when the officer pulled his vehicle behind Mr. Uh, Prescott and shined his light. A seizure occurs the, under the Fourth Amendment if, in view of all the surrounding circumstances, a reasonable person would believe that he or she is not free to leave. In situations involving a show of authority... Didn't the prosecution concede that he was detained and the question is whether it was a legal, a legal detention? Yes, Your Honor. I we're arguing in the event that this is held, that it's reversed, that this is not a consensual encounter, that the point of detention is the moment where the light was shined. And therefore, um, in this case, Officer Carroll coming to the adjacent lot, parking behind, parking his vehicle behind Mr. Prescott's, shining his light, calling a second officer to come to that same lot would make a reasonable person under the circumstances feel that they're not free to leave. In the case of People v. Wilkinson, the sixth district provided that the occupants of a station wagon were seized within the meaning of the fourth amendment when the police officer stopped and marked his patrol car behind the park station wagon. And under these circumstances, a reasonable person would not have been have felt free to leave. The court added that there were no objective factors in addition to the occupants sliding down in their seats or reclining and obstructing their view of the officer. Uh, additionally, in the case of People v. Gary, the first district provided uh, that, the, that when an officer pulls up behind a vehicle, shines his light, that there has to be additional affirmative actions by that officer that would indicate to the defendant that they're not free to leave. Does it, it matter? Does it matter how far behind the officer parks the car? I I can't tell from the record, which is one of the problems of being an appellate justice, is you can't ask the witnesses to clarify. I can't tell from the record whether Mr. Prescott had room if he had a when when the police when Carol's squad car pulled behind him whether there was room for him to leave, or whether he was blocked in. And, and so the question is, does that make a difference? 
Your Honor, I cited on page 320 of the record, um, the, the courts, uh, the district court determined that there was enough. There was two car spaces behind Mr. Prescott that he was able to reverse his car and leave um, if he wanted to. However, the question is, here is, based on the other circumstances or the totality of circumstances, a reasonable person in that position would not feel free to leave. Uh, in, in the case of uh, People v. Rico, the second district held that when a police officer was looking uh, for a car carrying two suspected individuals that were involved in this shooting, the officer drove beside a possible car, shined his light, and um, did not detain that individual, but merely shined his light. Again, the court said that just merely shining your light isn't enough when there is when there is no other affirmative action. And here, uh, Officer Carroll again went to the adjacent parking lot, pulled up behind him, shined his light, and although there was two spaces behind um, Mr. Prescott's vehicle, given Officer Carroll's conduct, that is calling a second uh, officer to come to the scene within 30 seconds, and then calling out to Mr. Prescott to exit the vehicle, a reasonable person in that individual's shoes would not feel free that they're able to terminate that encounter or so, leave. Ms. Petty, so if, if I could just follow up on that, does it matter for your position if, suppose we were to determine that there wasn't a detention just at the time that the light was shined, they pulled up behind the car and shined the spotlight, but it became a detention once the officer ordered Mr. Prescott out of the car, that it became a detention at that point. Does that matter for your position or would you, uh, would, would you still prevail on this point? Time is up, but it's up to the court whether to have the- so Go ahead and answer uh, the justice's question. Please. Thank you. Your honor, it doesn't matter when the light was turned on or when he asked them to exit the vehicle. What we're arguing is it's at the point that the individual wouldn't feel free to leave that that's not a consensual encounter. Opposing counsel might argue that that's a consensual encounter. However, we're arguing that those actions combined together within a short amount of time would not make a reasonable person feel free that they're able to terminate that encounter. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Fazy. Mr. Martinez, you've asked for 13 minutes. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready, Mr. Martinez. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Um, Your Honors, may I please set aside those two minutes for rebuttal? Absolutely. You have. Thank you. Thank you. We are before you today to prevent a potential grave injustice in which the threshold of a police officer's abilities have expanded over the people to the point where a constitutional right of a defendant is being turned into a mere privilege. The limit that exists between what the government can reasonably do and intruding into a person's privacy in the guise of reasonability is the very nature of what the right against unreasonable search and seizures was created for. As Ms. Fazy stated, today I will address the attenuation issue specifically that Officer Carroll's search of Mr. Prescott was unconstitutional for two reasons. First, the discovery of Mr. Prescott's parole status by Officer Carroll should not be considered an intervening circumstance ensuring that the taint of an illegal search is still present. And second, that the officer's actions were flagrant and purposeful under the facade of standard police practices. As to my first points, your honors, Mr. Prescott's parole status is not an appropriate intervening circumstance because this nation's highest court in Brown v. Illinois in a unanimous decision gave us the blueprint as to how to examine the exclusionary rule and determine evidence as fruit of the poisonous tree. The Supreme Court of California adopted these rules in People v. Brennan, and the three factors from this case are one, the time involved from the, the evidence sought to the evidence prevailed. There's just nothing in the record here that shows us that time was ever a factor between Officer Carroll's encounter of Mr. Prescott and the evidence sought. However, the second factor, the intervening circumstance, is the issue at hand here. Officer Carroll's search of Mr. Prescott's CDC Pearl status would normally be considered a, a, an avenue for him to conduct a search on Mr. Prescott. However, Officer Carroll was responding to a 911 call at the time for two individuals on bicycles that were allegedly having flashlights looking into cars getting ready to steal. Officer Carroll never committed an action involving looking for bicycles, looking for two assailants. Instead, as is stated on 310 of the record, 
he was drawn to several cars in an empty parking lot and happened to see Mr. Prescott reclined all the way back in the car. Officer Carroll was never responding to anything involving the 911 call essentially making the point of Mr. Prescott reclining and being the only person in the parking lot, that would be the issue of a crime. That is not illegal. Mr. Carroll hanging out in, Mr. Prescott hanging out in his car is not enough to warrant Officer Carroll's attention. As I, again, as in 310 of the record, Officer Carroll states that several vehicles caught his attention. He should have been looking for bicycles tucked under bushes, a bicycle maybe hidden behind a dumpster, something that have at least shown that he was responding to the 911 call. Well, if 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 Officer Carroll was just doing a routine patrol, no 911 call, and he saw a car with the seat reclined um, in a dark parking lot of a closed business, you don't think that's enough? It may not be reasonable suspicion, um, but you don't think that's enough to uh, catch his attention? And to and to without detaining to conduct some sort of inquiry, consensual perhaps. A consensual encounter would be ideal. That that would be a great a great point, Your Honor. And, and especially and, and during the consensual encounter, he could say, "By the way, are you on parole?" Couldn't he? And that's where the line should be drawn, Your Honors, because as people be robust, a sixth district decision of this state shows us. Um, the searches that are undertaken pursuant to a probationer's, probationer's advanced consent must be reasonably related to the purposes of probation. California Penal Code 3067 does state that any peace or parole officer can question a parolee. However, there are still limitations to that penal code that still encounter that even people on parole have to still have some rights. And under your honor's question, he shouldn't be able to just lead with that. And if he did lead with that, uh, I, I refer to Officer Carroll, he, Mr. Prescott would reasonably have the right to say no. And at that point, either the officer would say, move on with his day and continue his, his patrolling of, a, of an empty lot or determine something of earlier and looking for evidence. And that secondary aspect of just trying to find something would therefore be that fruit of the poisonous tree, which is the reason. Are you, are, are you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change focus slightly, but Sir. is it your position that we should adopt a per se rule that if there has been an unlawful detention, the subsequent discovery of a parole condition permitting search is never an attenuating circumstance? No, Your Honor, not never. That That is definitely not our position. However, it still should be a case by case scenario. And, um, and what what distinguishes the case where it is an attenuated, attenuating intervening circumstance and the case where it isn't? And why um, does this case fall on the side of the line that you're articulating? Sir, I, I would point your honor to um, a People v. Durant, a first district decision where um, that would not be a situation where the attenuation doctrine sh should apply. Under People Durant, um, an officer approached a car in which the passenger had uh, the outstanding warrant. Um, the officer then asked the defendant in that case if there was anything illegal, proceeded to do the search, and uh, People v. Durant concluded that that did attenuate and that the search was reasonable. That was a traffic violation which had an actual crime. People v. Bates, which is uh, the position that we would ask this court to adopt their rule, that one similarly was a car traffic stop. However, in that situation, the officer knew that the car, that the person in the car may have had a, a, an outstanding warrant. And therefore the officer in that case singled out the defendant simply for the fact that he thought there might be a crime. And as Ms. Fazy stated, the officer's hunch in People v. Bates was enough to violate the attenuation and prove that there was no intervening circumstance. The case at bar should follow Bates because even though there was an actual crime in People v. Bates, under the situation at hand, Officer Carroll was just simply looking for something that was not prevalent to the 911 call. Uh, Mr. Prescott was in his car doing nothing the day after New Year's. At that point, and it was even seven o'clock as it states on page 308 of the record. So it wasn't a time of day where it would be out of reason for somebody just to be out and about. Those situations compiled with the decision in Bates would allow this court to follow that rule and state there was no crime, there was nothing that would even perceive Officer Carroll to question Mr. Prescott aside from him hanging out by himself in his car, which by itself has no crime and is not connected to. 
Right, but necessarily, we're only going to be asking about attenuation if there was an unlawful detention in the first place, right? So the fact that there was an unlawful detention, if you're not advocating a per se rule, can't be the reason that we're going to find no attenuation. And, and, and in, in that regard, doesn't it make a difference whether the detention Mr. Carroll, I mean, we're both doing that. Mr. Prescott, um, Mr. Prescott wasn't moving. Doesn't and doesn't a unlawful traffic stop? Isn't that more of an infringement than a detention from a stationary individual who could have been consensually approached? Under that particular situation, no, Your Honor, because there's still a traffic violation, which would allow an officer to pursue a form of investigation, whether it's simply rolling through a stop sign or completely blowing through a red light. That's still a crime. It is not a crime for Mr. Prescott to just be fully recrimed. But yes, Your Honor. I want to finish your sentence. I want to follow up on Justice Burles's point. It doesn't have to be a traffic stop, does it? Don't police officers search for other things, like if someone is drunk in public, someone is homeless, might need help. Someone might have he, he might have had a heart attack in his car, and he was you know, the policeman was concerned that he needed help. And you don't need to have a, a crime for a policeman to inquire, do you? Absolutely not, Your Honor, and that brings a valuable point. It's still an officer's job to protect and serve. And that's the point of this whole thing. Mr. Prescott, being in his car, maybe needing help, would have still allowed Officer Carroll to potentially approach him, ask him, hey, were you the 911 caller? Did you see anybody driving around on bikes? Does anything look suspicious? Had those been Officer Carroll's actions in the beginning, we would not be having these particular conversations. Yes. I don't mean to be a stickler here, but that isn't really the issue. The issue is whether... He had, and I don't, I don't want to use a loaded term, a basis, a reason, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a plausible reason for asking for the ID. Because if he did, once you ask for the ID, your argument is dead, isn't it? I mean, then if, he's, if, if he had, once he had a reason to ask for that ID, and we're assuming an illegal detention to begin with, then the, he was under a parole condition search. And isn't that enough? Assuming he had a he had a constitutionally valid, I'm trying not to use loaded terms, under the case law, valid except a reason that the law has accepted for asking for someone's ID. You know? And I appreciate the, the yes. No, of course, Your Honor. I, I get your question. I get your concern. However, I think people v. Rodriguez can actually point us a little bit in that direction of, of just simply asking for uh, the ID and discovering the, the parole violation. Uh, people v. Rodriguez has stated that the question is whether or not the evidence was obtained by the government's exploitation of an illegality. And, and I think that's where the problem comes out, the illegality of the situation as to people v. Rodriguez. If you simply come up and ask for an ID during a routine search or had Officer Carroll approach Mr. Prescott, um, a question if he was the 911 caller and then asked for his ID, that again would be reasonable chain of events that would uh, allow for that to happen. And as People v. Bates did state, that there has to be a chain of causation proceeding from unlawful conduct that has to become the attenuation to remove the taint. There was no chain of events in this situation. And that's where Officer Carroll could have provided more details to the situation and not just simply approach Mr. Prescott. He was never responding his actions to the 911 call. And that Ms. leads Martinez, to- if, sir. If, I could, if I could just take it in a slightly different direction, one of my concerns about your position is just the People versus Brenlin case. I, I don't. I think that's um, one of the bigger hurdles you have to get over. Could you just tell me how, why Brenlin isn't just controlling and um, uh, on on the attenuation issue, and that is, you know, once they find, uh, I, in that case, I know it was an arrest warrant. It wasn't a a, a parole that the suspect was on parole. But it's still, why isn't it close enough uh, to be controlling here? Martinez, you have one minute. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, Brenlin, even though as a Supreme Court decision, is, is where we get the, the three factors from the situation. Uh, Brenlin allows for, for that second point of purposeful police misconduct. 
because under the situation, Officer Carroll's actions would have been enough to not allow attenuation. Um, people v. Robles, in addition to Brenlin, um, basically state that allowing the people to validate a warrantless residential search would encourage police to engage in, in invalid searches with increased odds that a justification could be found later. And there's a difference between this case and Brenlin, because here, Officer Carroll never did anything responding to a 911 call. There was no crime. There was no relation to the 911 call. And he still managed to find something that was justified later through Mr. Prescott's CDC parole violation. He had increased odds that something would be found, because in California, at any given time, there's over half a million. Your Honors, I see my time is up. May I briefly conclude? Please, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, and as for the reasons previously stated, Your Honors, we ask that you find the search unconstitutional and reverse the lower court's ruling. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Martinez. Ms. Bennett, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Julia Bennett, and I, along with my co-counsel, Fatima Letta, represent the respondents, the people of the state of California. Today, I will address why the detention was lawful, and my co-counsel will address why the evidence found during the detention should not be suppressed under the attenuation doctrine. This is a case about ensuring community and officer safety. And this appellant's detention was lawful because under the totality of the circumstances, including the 911 tip and the appellant's suspicious behavior, officers Carol and Stratford had a reasonable suspicion to detain. In 1978, the California Supreme Court in Henry Tony C held that Terry stops are permissible under California law when two circumstances are present. First, that the officers have a reasonable suspicion that crime is ongoing or has occurred. And second, that the officers have a reasonable suspicion that the individual that they detain was involved in that crime. Here, both circumstances are met. First, officers Carolyn Stratford had a reasonable suspicion that crime was ongoing or had occurred. As a basis for that reasonable suspicion, officers Carol and officers Stratford had a verified, corroborated, and reliable 911 call. The fourth district in People v. Pitts held that a 911 call or a tip may form the basis of a reasonable suspicion to detain when the tip includes specific, sufficient indicia of reliability. Here, the sufficient indicia of reliability standard was well surpassed. To start, the security guard herself directly witnessed these events. It was not a second or third hand account. Additionally, the tip was not anonymous. The security guard identified herself on the 911 call and the tip was independently corroborated. On pages 308 and 309 of the record, Officer Carroll testifies that he spoke to the security guard in person and that she specifically directed him to the 1432 River Park lot. The tip also came through 911, which the US Supreme Court in California v. Navarrete held further attests to a tip's veracity because 911 calls are traceable. The tip was about dangerous behavior, which could have harmed innocent bystanders, which the California Supreme Court in People v. Brown held makes it a matter of public safety for officers to follow up on. Two, tip also, two, yes, Your Honor. Two, two people were shining flashlights in cars. What was the criminal activity? Yes, Your Honor. Um, just because officers Carolyn Stratford did not observe the same facts that were reported in the tip does not mean that there is an inconsistency with the tip. Fair enough, fair enough. I'm not worrying about an inconsistency. I'm worrying about, I mean, the tip, the 911 call was incredibly reliable. But what it was reliable about was somewhat innocuous behavior. So how yeah. does that how does that satisfy the first prong of the Antonio C test? Your Honor, the 911 call was reporting two people, as you said, on bikes, shining flashlights into car, the sort of behavior that individuals attempting to break into a car would effectuate. And the security guard reported this as a potential car theft on page 306 to 308 of the record. So officers Carol and Stratford were responding to a call about a potential car theft, which is an ongoing or currently occurring crime. There was no car theft by the time Officer Carroll got there, was there? When Officer Carroll got there, there had not yet been a car theft, but the security guard's tip 
indicated that these suspects were still at large and still attempting to break into a car. Um, so it was still a matter of public safety for the officers to investigate and for the officers to prevent this crime from occurring. There were the, the, the suspects, the individuals were still break, trying to break into cars. Where is that in the record? The, on page 308 and 309 of the record, the security guard specifically directs Officer Carroll and Officer Shopard to the adjacent 1432 River Park lot. And the record is a little unclear on this matter, but we can infer that she directed the officers there because that's where the suspects had gone and that's where the suspects were continuing to shine flashlights into cars, continuing trying to break into a car. Um, additionally, if somebody unsuccessfully breaks into a car once, it's not unreasonable that they would go and attempt to break into another car afterwards. And yes, Your Honor. And you have the burden to put the evidence in front of the trial court? Yes, Your Honor, the government did have the burden to put that evidence before the trial court. Um, going off the record that we do have, officers Carolyn Stratford did have a reasonable suspicion under the second prong of the test laid out in Henry Tony C that Prescott specifically was involved in this reported potential car theft. It wasn't, while the tip formed the foundation for the reasonable suspicion, the inquiry didn't end there. Well, and there why, was a, excuse yes. me, why, why so? I mean, what, what identification factors did the security card give to the officer that would pinpoint this particular defendant, Mr. Prescott? That was the question I think Justice Perlis explored with your colleagues. And I was curious how you would answer that. Yes, Your Honor. There is a multitude of other factors which linked Prescott to this reported car theft. So I would draw your honor's attention to pages 308 and 310 to 312 of the record, where the circumstances that Officer Carroll and Officer Stratford were met with at the 1432 River Park lot is described. Uh, they arrived at this lot specifically at the direction of the security guard, specifically looking for individuals who were trying to or had successfully at this point broken into cars. They arrive at 7 p.m. in dark out. The business that this parking lot serves is clearly closed. There's only four to five cars in the entire parking lot. The parking lot is unlit and only one of the cars is occupied. And it's not even the fact that this is the only car that's occupied that forms the officer's reasonable suspicion. It is also the fact that the individual in this car is affecting suspicious behavior. The car is turned off, it's not running, no lights are on. The individual is sitting in the passenger side of the vehicle. The individuals reclined all the way back so that only the very top of their head is visible. And the officers drawing on their training and experience as the California Supreme Court and Henry Tony C said that officers may do in forming reasonable suspicion, recognize that this is the sort of behavior that somebody who just broke into a car would effectuate. Additionally, the officers could have reasonably suspected that there was another suspect in the car who had simply crouched down a little bit lower and whose head wasn't visible over the window. Yes, Your Honor. What do you do about the bicycles? I mean, you know, you, you, in other words, you're, you're ignoring the bicycles. The flashlight does is not so impressive to me, but the bicycles, he must have had a good, done a good job stashing them somewhere. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. It would have been reasonable had the officers suspected that um, the suspects had placed the bicycles laid down in the trunk of the car or underneath the car or stashed the bicycle somewhere else, potentially um, against the side of the building or in a bush somewhere when they successfully broke into this car. And I would know that there's an important distinction between a tip that the physical appearance and description of a suspect doesn't match the suspect that is ultimately detained. If a tip says, I witnessed a five foot four Caucasian female, and then the officers detained a five foot nine Hispanic male. And what occurred here, which is the tip said, these suspects are in possession of two objects, a flashlight and a bicycle, and the suspect was ultimately not found in possession of a suspect of a bicycle and a flashlight, but could have hidden that flashlight and that bicycle in the car, under the car, in the surrounding area. And doesn't that, that yes. I'm, I'm sorry, but doesn't that then, I mean, well, again, what we need is specific and articulable facts tying this suspect to the crime, to the suspected crime. And I'm, 
I, I'm, I am still wondering about the, whether there's any suspected crime out there because looking into cars with flash, you know, using flashlights to look into cars, yeah, it's suspicious, but it's not a crime as far as I know. And uh, I don't really see specific and articulable facts supporting that there was some crime and actual crime in progress as opposed to merely suspicious behavior. But to tie Mr. Prescott to that supposed crime, you can't, is, is it really okay to just say, well, yes, he could have hidden everything. <laughs> and then, uh, so, I mean, isn't that just, spec aren't we just into speculation then? Uh, how can that be enough to support the reasonable suspicion? He could have, I mean, what if we had a, a physical description of all of his clothing and the guy in the car is wearing something completely different? He said, well, he could have hidden that, he could have hidden the blue hoodie in the bushes too, uh, right? You can get rid of everything that way. And then aren't we in speculation land and not in reasonable suspicion land anymore? To address the first point that you raised about whether there was a reasonable suspicion that crime was ongoing at all. Um, thank you. First, I would note that this 911 tip came from a building security guard, not just any average person off the street. And so let, again, let, let's let's assume that the, the tip is rock solid. The, the security guard is as honest as the day is long and saw clearly what they saw and so there were definitely two people with bicycles and flashlights looking into cars. So that's that's the truth. Yeah. But then the question is, right, but where's the crime and where's the connection to Prescott? Yes, Your Honor. And the security guard reported this crime as a potential car theft. And the security guard is someone who's trained to spot out and identify and stop crime. That is their job. And so if they're saying that this was a potential car theft, that speaks more to it being an ongoing crime than if this was a random passerby who linked these two behaviors. This is someone whose job it is to identify crime, who identified this behavior as a potential crime. And then addressing the second part of your question about the specific and articulable facts that specifically link Prescott to this crime, it is the one, it is how close in time these two events were. Um, the officers quickly responded to the scene. They were immediately directed to the adjacent lot. It's the fact that there was only four or five other cars present. It's the fact that the business was closed, that it was nighttime, that it was dark out. And there really is no other justification to be in this parking lot. It's the fact that Officer Carroll verified that the suspect was not asleep, was not somebody sleeping in their car. It's the fact that the suspect affected behavior, which could be reasonably understood to be evasive as trying to hide from the police. And I would point your honors to People v. Brown, a California Supreme Court case where there was no suspect description, but there was a report of a violent crime and officers were just in the vicinity, not even at the specific location of the crime. And it was 1030 at night and dark out in a residential area. So similar to here where there wasn't a reason for a lot of cars to be around and they saw a suspect driving down the road. And that was enough. That was enough to form reasonable suspicion to detain that individual. Yes, Your Honor. I have a concern about that position. So you're, you're saying that if, if there's a, a crime reported in an area and a police car is, is just driving by, they can, they can, without violating the Fourth Amendment, just stop someone without any description? And, and, the, and, and in today's world of, of, you know, racial profiling and so forth, that gives me great concern if that's what the people's position is. I'd no, like Your Honor. To to that. That's not our uh, position. I just wanted to contrast the facts in People v. Brown with the facts here, which is that the officers were not just in a vicinity of a reported crime, but were specifically directed to this location by a security guard. And that it wasn't just that someone was driving down the street, but that somebody was parked in their car, sitting in the passenger seat, had no lights on, was reclined in such a way that it appeared they were hiding from the police and that that behavior is a sort of behavior that somebody that just broke into a car would effectuate. And so that as compared to rulings of the California Supreme Court, there's actually many more specific and articulable facts present in this case that directly tie the appellant to this reported crime. Was, was there anything that Officer Carroll saw that suggested the car that Mr. Prescott was in had been broken into by somebody who didn't own or have permission to be in the car? Your Honor, um, I think the only thing in the record and that would speak to that is the fact that Prescott was sitting in the passenger side of the vehicle, as opposed to someone who had just driven up in the parking lot would likely be um, in the driver's seat. 
And also, right, with but the, he was he was reclined, so he obviously hadn't just driven up. Yes, Your Honor, that um, is our point. He was so he wasn't just driving up and parked the car. Um, he would have had to get out of the car and then go move to the passenger seat and then recline, which would be a slightly weird posture for somebody who owned the car to effectuate. Um, but it was dark no. out, so any of those unless, visible signs, unless you unless you want to stretch out and don't have the pedals blocking your feet when you want yeah. to take a nap, or, or you're in a hangover from the first from New Year's. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and I would note that any sort of outward markings on the vehicle would be hard to see because it was dark out and the parking lot was unlit. Um, so it really did require an investigation, which the California Supreme Court in People v. Sousa described investigatory stops as brief, as meant to dispel ambiguities, to determine whether crime is underway. And I would also note that the reasonable suspicion to carry out an investigative stop is significantly less than probable cause to effectuate an arrest. And Your time. I, see, I see that my time is up. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Bennett. Ms. Lodha, you have 15 minutes. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Fatima Lodha for the respondent, and I will be discussing how the attenuation doctrine applies in this case. As my co-counsel demonstrated, Officer Carroll legally detained Prescott in this case. However, even if the court were to find that the detention was not legal, under the attenuation doctrine, the evidence seized from Prescott should not be suppressed for two reasons. First, Prescott's parole search condition was an intervening circumstance that was independent from the initial alleged illegal conduct because, to quote Utah v. Streep, it predated the investigation and was entirely unconnected to the stop. And second, officers Carroll and Stratford did not act flagrantly or with the hope that something would come up. As to the first point, the parole search condition should be an intervening circumstance because it is entirely unconnected to the purposes of the stop and thus dissipates any alleged illegal illegality of the stop committed by the officers. Prescott's parole search condition specifically should constitute an intervening circumstance under the attenuation doctrine analysis because it is an independent act by the defendant, which thus breaks the causal chain linking the illegality and the subsequent evidence found. So oh, let me, Ms. Lada, let me ask you the converse of what I asked Mr. Martinez. Are, are you advocating for a per se rule that no matter the nature of the unlawful detention, the discovery before the search of the parole condition sanitizes the search? My no, word, you're not. Not, not, not dissipates, but sanitizes. No. no, Your Honor, we're not asking for a per se rule. In fact, the attenuation doctrine itself has checks in it uh, to uh, where courts can look at the circumstances surrounding uh, officers' conduct, um, such as the flagrancy and the purpose of the officers' conduct in order to evaluate whether the evidence should be let in. Right, but all of the points that you just made about the independence of the parole search and the fact that the parole condition preceded the unlawful conduct, the allegedly unlawful conduct in the detention, that's true in every case, isn't it? That's right, but um, the court would still need to complete the attenuation doctrine analysis and in order to do so, look at the third prong of the attenuation doctrine. So uh, it would be, it would, as, as opposing counsel rightly pointed out, it would potentially lead to uh, uh, too, too much police authority in these circumstances if the court were not to check um, police authority under the attenuation doctrine. And this is such a case where uh, the parole search condition did supply the officer with an independent legal authorization in order to um, conduct that search. Well, I'm, I'm concerned with your position, and I, 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 again, following up on Justice Perlis's per se point, um, what prevents the police from stopping any car, ask, you know, illegally, let's say, you know, uh, asking for ID, then searching the car to see if it reveals a parole, you know, uh, uh, searching, the, gets the ID, sees the parole condition, and then you're into your argument, then any search would be okay, would, would, and, and, and it seems to me that that would vitiate the protection of the Fourth Amendment. Your Honors, an officer still needs to have uh, the requisite suspicion in order to 
actually conduct a stop or search. And in the absence of that requisite suspicion, that mistake has to be made in good faith. I would um, point your honors to the case People v. Durant, where the court found that the officer who, connected the, who, who conducted the initial illegal traffic stop made that mistake, uh, and that mistake was made in good faith. And so therefore, the subsequent probation search condition that was found about the defendant um, was uh, a law was lawful and, and the evidence found was then let into the record. Um, I have a question. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Judge Manitres. You go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, so first, so I take your position is as long as the the initial detention is in good faith, um, I believe that's what you just articulated, then the discovery of the parole condition will attenuate, um, assuming that the, the detention was unconstitutional, even though in good faith. So first, uh, what does it take for it to be in good faith? And here in particular, I, I did definitely notice that the officer in his testimony, even his own testimony, I thought was quite weak. He said something like that. Uh, he, he, he described the fact that he thought gave him reasonable suspicion. And then he said, um, they gave him reason, you know, cause to believe that Prescott may or may not be involved in the um, illegal conduct in the area. I mean, if, is that enough for even good faith? That is that the officer thought uh, that, that, you know, he had facts showing the, the so-called suspect may or may not be connected to illegal activity in the area. Is that, is that good faith? Good faith. A, a court may look at, for example, if an officer is making up material facts in order to effectuate a stop. So in People v. Rodriguez, in that case, the court found that it was possible that the officers had fabricated material facts in order to conduct a traffic stop. And if that were the case, then that would be a showing of bad faith and would also show flagrant and purposeful police misconduct under the third prong of the attenuation doctrine. In that case, the court found that um, the that third prong of the attenuation doctrine would make it so the evidence would not be led into their record and would be suppressed because that would be a showing of bad faith. Here, the officers, as my co-counsel demonstrated, were responding to a corroborated 911 tip and reasonably believed that the, the press that specifically was linked to the crime that they were investigating. Okay, yes, so, so let me follow up on that. So I would... Think that, and, and I'm sorry, Justice Bendix. So, uh, no, no, we'll you. It, I see. So, I see my questions. Okay, so, so because I, I would think that good faith and reasonableness are different things. So it, it might be that the the officer believed in good faith, you know, genuinely believed, honestly believed that he had reasonable suspicion to to uh, conduct the detention. Um, but it might be that that honest belief was just unreasonable not only incorrect, but unreasonable. Now, if that's the case here, uh, how does that fit with your version of the rule? So if, if assume the officer had a good faith belief that it was a lawful detention, but suppose it was an unreasonable, honest, but unreasonable belief that it was a lawful detention, would the parole conditions still attenuate or not? In that case, your honor, if the, if it was an honest but unreasonable mistake, and and I'm and and unreasonable would would really hinge on whether the officer was really veering away from their training, for example, or were making many logical jumps in order to target a certain suspect. Then, under the flagrancy prong of the attenuation doctrine, it's um, completely possible for courts to find that the evidence should be suppressed. However, that is not the case here. In our case. The officer, under both the intervening circumstance prong of the attenuation doctrine, where the officer was able to find the parole search condition, and, and as your honors may know, uh, under California Penal Code Section 3067, parolees are subject to searches any time of day or night, um, with or without suspicion by a parole agent or officer. And the reason our legislature has made parole search conditions so broad is that, um, as, our, as the court in Samson v. California noted, parolees have a lower reasonable expectation of privacy because the state has a vested interest in supervising them because there are many of them are more likely to commit future offenses. And so 
if the state of California, both the legislature and our judiciary has provide uh, officers with a separate legal authorization to conduct these searches, even suspicionless searches of parolees, then it seems uh, philosophically consistent with the aims of our criminal law to allow parole search conditions to serve as an intervening circumstance and the subsequent evidence seized from that search to be led into the record. And um, finally, um, on this point, Your Honors, I'd just like to say the parole search condition should serve as an intervening circumstance because it is the result of the defendant's independent actions and not the police officers. This is similar to what our court said in People v. Brennan, which as uh, the justice pointed out earlier, is a uh, Supreme Court of California case about how an arrest warrant may serve as an intervening circumstance under the attenuation doctrine. Well, but and isn't, that isn't that different? If an officer, this is a hypothetical, mm -hmm. uh, as I like to ask, but if an officer knows that somebody has an outstanding arrest warrant, they can detain the person and conduct a search. But if the officer knows that somebody has an outstanding parole condition, that doesn't give them the right to detain the person. So isn't the intervening nature of an arrest warrant and the, the implications for an individual's freedom or lack of freedom significantly different from the existence of a parole condition allowing a search? Svara, you have less than five minutes. Um, I'd like to answer your question in two parts. First, Your Honor, in Brennan, the arrest, uh, the, the warrant uh, status of the defense or of the suspect was discovered after the right. initial detention. So just to clarify the timeline, and that is similar here as well. Um, but just to your point about the differences between a warrant and a parole search condition, you're right, there are certain differences. For example, a warrant um, has a much stronger and immediate obligation on officers, whereas a parole search condition is much more discretionary. However, both provide some kind of obligation or even authority to law enforcement officers to be able to conduct these searches because there's been either ongoing or has uh, previously been criminal or at least suspicious activity by the suspect. In addition, both are the result of the defendant's own actions, supplying the officer a legal authorization that is separate from the initial illegal conduct that the officer may have conducted. And so it's not only as I said earlier, not only philosophically consistent with our criminal, but also administratively consistent for, for allowing parole search conditions to serve as an intervening circumstance. And um, opposing counsel mentioned that probation uh, uh, cases such as people be based where a probation search condition was not seen as an intervening circumstance. However, two points to this, Your Honor. A probation search condition is very unlike a parole search condition. Parolees have even lower expecta reasonable expectations of privacy than even probationers because the crimes they've been convicted of are more serious and they're effectively uh, finishing their prison sentences outside of prison. And so, um, and in addition, in Bates, the officer had learned about the felony probation status of the suspect prior to conducting the uh, illegal detention. And so in that case, the court was uncomfortable in extending Durant because the officer had kind of acted in order to effectuate a fishing expedition, which the court did not like. Whereas our case is more like the case in People v. Durant, where the officer had conducted an initial illegal traffic stop, upon which they discovered that the suspect had a probation search condition attached to them. And the fruits of that uh, search were then allowed into the record. And the reason was, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that mistake of the initial, that mistake where the officer believed he had the requisite suspicion to conduct the initial traffic stop was made in good faith, and the officer's behavior was not arbitrary, capricious, or harassing. And this leads me to my final point, Your Honor. The officers, Carroll and Stratford, did not act flagrantly or with the purpose of uh, conducting a fishing expedition. Carroll did not pursue Prescott with the purpose of finding an outstanding warrant, or he did not, and he did not misuse his authority and any mistake he, he made was made in good faith regarding the legality of the initial seizure. His conduct was neither purposeful nor flagrant. On page 312 of the record, we see that Officer Carroll asked Prescott to step out of the vehicle as part of standard procedure and for the purposes of officer safety, not to target or harass Prescott. When he asked Prescott to identify himself, and provide, and provide his registration information, it was because 
he was in that parking lot to investigate a car theft. And so it was reasonable for him to confirm that Prescott was the owner of the vehicle he was in. Ms. Lotto, yes, I have a question that maybe is beside the point, but, okay. but how was it consistent? If he had to ask Prescott to get out of the car for officer safety, how is it consistent to then allow him to go back into the car to get his identification where he could have had a gun? One minute. But, um, I can well, just briefly officer... follow up on that just so you can okay. respond at the same time. Doesn't that call into question whether this was good faith? Right, because he says, "Oh, I got him out for officer safety," but then I let him go back in to get his ID. Does that raise questions about about the good faith of the officer? That does not, Your Honor. And and just to um, answer the first uh, Justice Perlis's question, um, Officer Carroll was there with Officer Stratford, and earlier in the record, he mentions that he he had approached Prescott with Officer Stratford because he wanted backup in this kind of interaction. So Officer Carroll was really relying on his expertise and training as a police officer, even when, he, especially when he, um, when he asked Prescott to identify himself, that was necessary in order for him to conduct his uh, in, investigatory function in this interest. I see I'm out of time, yes, John, may I briefly, briefly answer this finish. question? Briefly yeah. answer, please. And he was trying to, con um, to complete his investigatory function by asking for Prescott's identification. Uh, thank you, Your Honors. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Lyle. Mr. Martinez, your rebuttal. Yeah, two minutes remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in rebuttal, I'm only going to address two points, Your Honors. Uh, first, the CDC status is not connected because as 3067 shows, people v. Durant does give that limit that an arbitrary or capricious reason does violate an officer's actions to be able to conduct that search. As Justice Mentras point out, reasonableness and good faith are not the same and they're not connected by Officer Carroll's actions. His actions are completely different to the 911 call, which he's supposed to be responding to. And as, as Justice Benetrix pointed out, if we follow the decision in strike, if where that shows that, that any type of, of warrant or, or even traffic violation could exist, we'll now allow an officer to stop anybody on the street, ask for their ID, and go on that fishing expedition for any potential crime that could be out there, desperately violating an individual's Fourth Amendment right. And as for the second point, a 911 call is not a free pass on the Fourth Amendment. Just because there was a 911 call does not mean that an officer can reply to, to any event and search and conduct that further fishing expedition. As Justice Perlis mm -hmm. pointed out, two people shining flashlights is not a crime. There was no crime that Officer Carroll was responding to that would show any facts that allow Mr. Prescott to be a subject of an investigation. And that does indeed open the door to police misconduct to be overshadowed by a mistake or by a hunch and allow that slippery slope to become president. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Martinez, not, not just to be devil's advocate here. So what was the officer supposed to do? He gets a call saying that he suspects criminal activity in a parking lot at a time when people really shouldn't be in that parking lot because there's no stores open, it's dark and so forth. Under your theory, he should just drive by because he doesn't have any more information. And you think at that point, you know, he, he anything he does after, if he if he doesn't do anything but drive by, he's violating the Fourth Amendment. I'm, um, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with the extremeness, uh, the extremity, I don't know, of your argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's up to the court as to whether you can proceed. Very, very briefly, please respond to Justice Bennett. Thank you, Your Honor, and I will. Um, uh, Justice, uh, in that situation, he should have followed the actions of the 911 call. Search for two assailants, search for bicycles before he began searching the car or searching the lot for four or five cars, as he stated on page 308 of the record, which was the first action which he did. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all, counsel. The cause will stand submitted at this time. That concludes the oral argument. The members of this court will now confer separately outside this call. Okay, so it's back to me. Congratulations for a fantastic final round. And as the justices talk off camera, we have some uh, awards to announce. So let's see, if the uh, finalists want to go off camera while we do this, so you can have a little <laughs> time to breathe and exhale and 
drink of uh, have a drink of water or something while we give some awards. Um, thank you to everybody who attended today. We have quite a uh, big audience and that is really exciting and thrilling. I would like to start with the award for excellence in appellate advocacy. And that's the award that brings the two teams basically to the final. So it's a combo of the brief and the Saturday arguments. And the winner of excellence in appellate advocacy is Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley is uh, first place with McGeorge, of course, being second place. Um, let's see the congratulations. The Giznet Mandel Award for best brief goes to Berkeley, second place McGeorge, third place Empire, and fourth place Loyola. That is the brief writing category. And finally, we have merit awards for oral argument from our Saturday rounds. The winner of the Jeffrey Hall Wright Award for best oralist. And I recommend you go to the competition program to read about this award and the person for whom it is named, Jeffrey Hall Wright. The winner of the Jeffrey Hall Wright Award is Julia Bennett from Berkeley. Congratulations. We also have individual merit awards for oral argument as follows. Brooke Quesenberry of Hastings, Andrea Mendez of Loyola, Flora Faisi of McGeorge, Carrigan Huerta of San Joaquin, Steve Martinez from McGeorge, Vanali Kayabayab of Davis, Sarah Baig of Hastings, Jason Trujillo, UWLA, El Madavi, Berkeley, Amanda Rodriguez Kern, Mackenzie Barrett, Davis, Besan Farra of San Joaquin, and Nikki Razapur of UWLA. So congratulations to all. The justices are conferring as to the results of today's uh, round. And for all the wonderful advantages of doing the competition, via Zoom, like we can, you know, avoid the plague and <laughs> we can also uh, uh, save on travel and all, there are a lot of advantages, but we do miss seeing you in person. And I really miss the opportunity to uh, award this <laughs> to the winners. This is the Roger Trainer Trophy, the picture of which is on the website. And all the winners' names are engraved. Going back to, let's see, on here, the earliest one I see is, oh, Santa Clara in 1970. And so here's the cup. And the winners from today are going to get to keep this for a year until next year's trainer, which I hope you'll all join us for. So I'm going to um, mute for a few minutes while the justices talk, and then we'll come back and give that trophy out. Welcome back. Our finalists, if you'd like to turn on your cameras now and join us, that would be great. Thank you. That was one of the harder post-argument deliberations that I've been involved in in my 20 years of uh, being a justice of the Court of Appeal. Um, before we give you our decision, 
Um, each of us would like to share a little bit of uh, feedback with you, um, either specifically about your uh, oral arguments or maybe even a little bit more generally about um, uh, thoughts that we have that were prompted by your oral argument about uh, good appellate advocacy. So we'll start with uh, Justice Bendix. All right, well, the, um, it's easy to talk about your arguments because all of you did such a really good job and, and we all agreed we can see why your teams were in the final. Um, uh, and so it, it's, it, it's a pleasure to discuss your arguments. Um, Ms. Fazy, I, I like the way that you responded to Justice Perlis's questions and, and, and you're working in pits and the record into your answers because that's important in, in, in a, a appellate a, a advocacy. Um, you knew the record, you knew the case law, and you used it to answer the questions effectively. Um, um, Mr. Martinez, I especially liked your introduction to your argument. You know, you gave us a roadmap. Now, when you're in, in, in a real way, you will see, if you go in a courtroom where you have arguments, there's usually arguments all day. And, you know, the justices need so it helps if you focus the justices with a roadmap where you're going, because we have a lot on our minds. So um, I, I really like that. And, 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 and that's true in good brief writing, but it's especially true in oral advocacy. Um, Ms. Bennett, I, I thought you also did a very good job of describing the cases but in the context of the facts, you know, of, of this case, you know, sometimes when you do these moot courts, because I've done a few, you get an exegesis on search and seizure law as if the, four pe the three people in front of you never heard about search and seizure law. Um, so that we don't need, but we do need to know why the law means you win based on the record in front of you. And I, I thought you did a, a good job with that. Um, um, Ms. Lada, I thought we asked you in some ways the hardest questions. Maybe we were coming in our own. <laughs> and, um, but I, I thought, and I think you did a very good job, you know, left, um, backhand, forehand with all of that, um, with what we were, were doing. And, and um, I don't think I would have had the aplomb that you had at your stage. I, I probably, <laughs> it, would, it would have been very intimidating for me. So those are my overall comments. Thank you. Justice Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I think I, I can just echo <laughs> what Justice Bendix said. Uh, I was very impressed with all four. Um, I, I also think it's completely unsurprising that the four of you are the finalists here, um, though I guess I didn't see the rest of the pool, but you are all excellent. You just did a terrific job. And um, uh, I, I was very impressed with both uh, your mastery of the record and um, and the case law and your your facility to you know be able to draw on on uh, different cases in response to different questions and uh, uh, your responsiveness to the questions you know understanding the question and and directly addressing it you know hitting the call of the question and not uh, fighting the hypothetical and that kind of, that kind of thing so. Um, I, I thought all four of you were just, were just terrific. I agree. I, I, I'm inclined to agree with this, Benix, that um, Ms. Lada had uh, the hardest questions, um, but I, I thought you handled them um, very capably. So uh, uh, that's about it for me. Well done. I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in some respects, this may be hard for you to imagine, but um, the pressure that I imagine each of you felt coming in to this morning's final argument probably will be greater than uh, the pressure you feel when you pass the bar and are actually in our court. Um, because there seems so much that is uh, writing on it. In fact, in the, in the uh, moot court finals, my third year of law school, I was not uh, a, a moot court advocate uh, that year, but in the finals, uh, it was live, it was in the courtroom, and one of the advocates fainted uh, in the middle of his oral argument um, and came back and the, the justice that was presiding at, at that moot court uh, explained to him that you know, the pressure 
uh, is great because it's your teammates. But in real life, it's only a client. So, you know, it doesn't matter quite as much as doing a good job for your teammates. So each of you did great job for your teammates uh, in, in connection. And it's my understanding that there may even be a third member of at least some of the teams that uh, were uh, part of the competition. And so you're all to be commended. Um, uh, the Three most important things, uh, I think, in oral advocacy, and, and both Justice Bendix and Justice Minitris, in, in my view, properly uh, uh, identified them and said that you all did it well, is one, being familiar with the record. Um, I, I thought the um, uh, Ms. Fazy, when I asked, uh, based on my actual lack of recollection of the record, about whether Prescott could pull away um, to cite to directly the point in the record where that issue had been determined. Um, even though it wasn't particularly helpful to you, um, that fact, it was nonetheless something that I was interested in because I asked the question. And, and, and you all did that. You all were able to cite the portions of the record in response to questions. The second thing is, is the good use of, of case law. And again, you all were very familiar with it. Um, but the, really the, the, the overall point, to some extent, um, the, all of that should, I mean, the nature of this competition is a little different, but all of that will be in your briefs. Um, the citations to the record, the use of the, I mean, not all the briefs we see, but, but they, <laughs> no. they, 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 it, should all, it should all be in your briefs. And so really what you wanna be doing in, it's, it's an oversimplification, uh, but I think there is some truth to it, which is the brief tells the court how to decide the case your way, and oral argument is an opportunity for you to tell the court why we should decide the case your way. And so it's, it's as Justice Bendix pointed out, it's, the, it's not simply telling us what the case, this case held this and this case held that, but why in the context of these facts, uh, 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 it is important to come out in your favor. Um, and again, you know, being direct in responding to the court's questions, I mean, that's what oral argument is about. And the questions, and you can't always tell how a justice is leaning based on the question. Um, I, I've had a number of uh, folks um, who uh, have said to me after the case was decided, um, gee, I left your courtroom thinking I was going to win, <laughs> you know, and I don't win that many. They're typically the lawyers that argue against Professor Glassman and his side of the case. And they, they, they leave thinking, oh, gee, maybe this is going to be one of those cases where we reverse the criminal conviction, um, because I asked the hard questions. Um, and that's really what oral argument is all about. And you all did incredibly well with that. Um, I am going to announce the winner, uh, although, as I say, it's hard. There were no dissenting votes, although there could easily have been a two to one decision either way. Um, but team six. Ms. Bennett and Ms. Ladha, um, we have decided that you were the winning oral argument team uh, this morning. So congratulations to all of you, and in particular uh, to uh, Ms. Ladha and Ms. Bennett. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you all very much. Right. Uh, Professor Glassman, I just I just wonder if, if uh, I see that it's my, by my clock, 1126, which is still a few minutes before the projected 1130 time. I think if any of the advocates had something that they wanted to ask us uh, about their argument or about argument in general, um, that we would be happy to respond. I, or not. I have one comment? Um, I wanted to add one more comment. I think, I, I don't know which one of you, I think it was Ms. Lada. You conceded something to the other side. I, I don't. I think it was you. That's a very good thing to do. I mean, justice appellate advocates note note when you don't when you make their life easier when you don't make them decide things that aren't in dispute. Um, and so and 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 it's it's a, and you did it in a gracious way, which is it didn't sound unctuous. Sometimes when people do that, it sounds unctuous, but it it, it was. 
that that's a that's a good uh, to add to the primer of appellate advocacy. Concede the point you have to, you know, and then and then focus the court on why it doesn't matter. One one of the things we did not do that. To, what 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 I'm about to say we did not do, but one of the things, particularly if you're in Division Seven, which is my court. Um, uh, when, for example, we're talking about whether the whether the, these facts added up to uh, reasonable suspicion would be to either add or subtract. Um, well, but if if in fact the report had been that individuals were actually breaking into cars as opposed to just shining flashlights, would that make a difference? Uh, if there had been a bicycle in the bushes, but it was 20 yards away from Prescott's car. Would that have made a difference? Those kinds of questions. So when you're preparing for oral argument, you need to be, and 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 that occurs to me because of what Justice Bendix just said, because you may want to concede, yes, you know, if that had happened, yeah, that might well have been uh, reasonable suspicion, but that didn't happen here. And that's exactly the point. I had one question I was curious whether all of you thought about, but I didn't want to take your time on it. You know, the standard of review I was trouble, I was thinking about here, all of you were talking about you infer this, you imply this, but that makes a difference in the Court of Appeal because the normally we're supposed to take all infer everything in favor of the judgment or the decision. I'm, I'm speaking very broadly here. So when someone says that, my ears go up because the 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 appellant has the unlike below has the burden to show error on appeal, and so you you were all sort of using that term, and I see you have to be careful when you're in a, in, a, in an appellate court because because of that general rule. Now I realize we're talking about a constitutional issue here, but but still, if you the facts, we are stuck with the facts from the lower court. And the fact that the prosecution had the burden below, remember I asked that question, had the burden below to do X, it's still on the appellant to show error on appeal. And that sometimes can make all the difference. So that, that was one thing I think you always have to think about in any argument. What was the burden below and what was, but, but if you're the appellant, what do I have to do to over to, get over all the presumptions and all the intendments and all the stuff that they talk about in appellate review. And, and, and it's, it's a different position than being in the trial court. And it takes a while to get used to that, I think. When I pro tem, I would, you know, I'd say, you, pro teming means you're, you're the ten, you're, you fill in a vacancy for temporarily. And I remember I'd look, sometimes I'd look in the first week get in a, a decision. I said, why'd the trial judge do that, you know? That's the wrong question. Uh, and, and so you, your job is to show error by the trial court. The four of you are about to embark on, uh, I'm sure, long and successful legal careers. Do you have any questions for the justices while we have them before we say goodbye and end the competition? No, just a resounding thank you. And, and this has been an experience. Congrats, yeah. ladies. I all wish there could have been two gold cups. You would been excellent teams, really excellent. I, I wish all our arguments were as equally good, if I may say, in the real world as they were today. All thank right. you so much. All right. Good I, luck I, I to really, all of you. Thank you. I really enjoyed arguing against uh, Team Four. Maybe you could all defer graduation and we'll do it again next year. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. We look forward to seeing you in our courts. All righty. Bye bye. Well Glass done. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Glassman. Thank you, Ms. Skilling. Thank, thank you all. I look forward to driving this up north to drop it off at Berkeley for the winners. Thank you everybody for attending and participating in this year's trainer. See you next year.